Coursing through the veins of every American boy turned man is a majestic myth, a kind of promise made to us about what we are and what we can be. It throbs in our red blood, pumped like an engine from our hearts and it pounds out the cadences of the banging pulse in our necks and it's released finally into our brains where it swirls like an exploding sky on the 4th of July making us punch drunk and woozy and half delusional as we stand at the foot of old glory and look up with pride shimmering in our wet eyes blinded by God's good sun as it pierces through the threadbare red white and blue this myth this promise this majesty takes the form in today's media cacophony of Ford trucks and football and beer made on the mountain in the Rockies. A generation ago, it had something to do with astronauts and the race to the moon and the wild frontiers beyond the stars. Before that, though, it was more picturesque. It had something to do with sunsets and 10-gallon hats and the pastoral landscapes of the West, the pristine infinity of the desert in the morning and a cactus rose, wild lands where you could fall in love with an exotic woman and endure the heartbreak of saying goodbye to her in a dusty train station somewhere beyond the plains. This myth resides in a place where you roast jackrabbits over an open campfire with a buddy you trust more than yourself. It's a place where you, among all the other heathens infesting this planet, reserve the exclusive right to question God because you are 100% pure American down to your very molecules and you can't help but walk with him. It can be argued that all adventure stories, perhaps even all drama even, is a sort of wish fulfillment. But after reading Cormac McCarthy's All the Pretty Horses, it became clear to me that his one of his main objectives, perhaps the objective, was to explore the American male myth as he understands it or wishes for it. Now, I don't know how much a traditional folk lullaby, all the pretty little horses, factored into McCarthy's titling of the book, but its lyric seems to support the above claim that it's a sort of dream wish fulfillment of the American male psyche. Hush abide, don't you cry, go to sleep, little baby. When you wake, you shall have all the pretty little horses. Way down yonder in the meadow, poor little baby crying, Mama, Mama. The birds and the butterflies flood around his eyes, poor little baby crying, Mama. Don't you cry, when you wake you shall have all the pretty little horses. Now most remarkable about the book, perhaps, is that he wrote it at a time when the western was a genre all but dead. And despite that, he wove into it just about every cowboy cliche there is. And this without an iota of the, this is so bad it's good irony anywhere to be found. He was able to do this because he recognizes that cliches become so because they contain simple and inherent truths, and simple and inherent truths hold power whether earnestness is fashionable or not, and so from a palette of dead genre and cliché, he painted a pastoral masterpiece because he is a master of his craft and tells his simple truth simply and with cool earnestness. He is without question one of the greatest American writers living today. But wait. I'm supposed to be talking about Billy Bob Thornton's 2000 film adaptation of All the Pretty Horses starring Matt Damon and Penelope Cruz. Mm. <laughs> well, you probably guessed by now that there's a reason why I'm stalling, but in case you haven't, I better lay down the disclaimer before I say another word. There's no way in hell that this film is going to get a fair shake here, and if you're a fan of it, my apologies, but I've read the book and the film's been overpowered. It's plain and simple. Of course, that's just another way of saying the book is better than the movie, but perhaps the adage hasn't been more true than in this case. Both the film and the novel chronicle the heroic journey of John Cole Grady, a 17-year-old who rides off of his family's doomed Texas ranch into Mexico in search of adventure, himself, God, and the American spirit. But the ways the film falls short are myriad. There's the photography that feels artificial and never evokes the mystic awe of the novel's landscape, a landscape that in its written form feels haunted by savage ghosts both present and future. There's the film's slavish subservience to exposition, where the novel makes enigmatic statements with no explanation, where it poses questions and demands close attention, the film explains away plot points and quick bursts of dialogue and voiceover. Oof. There's also the pacing, where Cormac's sentences meet out a methodic, haunting beat. The film speeds through with montages set to mawkish music, rushing headlong to the next scene set up. But more than anything else, what the film lacks is the novel's spirit, that ineffable aura that churns like primordial blood just below the skin of all McCarthy. I don't mind a filmmaker making his own artistic statement with a work of adaptation. In fact, I value it more than didactic regurgitation, but no clear vision emerged from Thornton, and McCarthy's was just diluted somewhere in the scripting phase. Grabbing hold of the ineffable spirit of a work and representing it on film is a difficult matter to execute, I'd imagine, though at least one of the films we'll talk about later was able to achieve it and was able to achieve it remarkably well. But here what we have instead is the antithesis of the spirit of the book. It feels like a collection of maudlin genre cliché. 
The truth is, taking hold of the ineffable is perhaps most difficult with McCarthy. He's a writer who makes his stock and trade the ineffable. But it's that very quality that draws me back to his novels time and again. What compelled me to want to revisit No Country for Old Men. And in the end, it's why I chose McCarthy as the centerpiece for the show. Though I know talking about his works and the films inspired by them will be no easy task. I'm searching for a better understanding of the inexpressible McCarthy. Not to master it, for I don't think that could be done. And by his design. Rather, I like to think of this as an inquiry and an attempt to feel the legends he puts forth more fully. So yeah, here we have a uh, tale of two cities, I think. Uh, you have the novel on one hand, which is a masterpiece, and then you have uh, just a piece. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna say something uh, right off the bat, because uh, I just wanna make one thing loud and clear before we get started with this film. And uh, I, I can't stand cowboys, <laughs> okay? I, I cannot stand cowboys all right I did you have a bad experience with a cowboy at some I just point don't, i don't like the hats i don't like the boots i don't <laughs> like the fucking marlboro man i don't like <laughs> bull riding horse riding i don't like fucking spurs i'm not into the music i just can't stand the cowboy the whole cowboy package just turns you off adam <laughs> it makes me want to puke <laughs> it really does so and Joe knows this, and I think Dave does from being on the show that, like, you know, I'm not a fan of the Western. I, I'm, I never have been. And it's because of my disdain toward the cowboy, I think. <laughs> I mean, it's got to be, right? But, uh, Joe, you said at some point during your review that McCarthy wrote this novel at a time when uh, the genre, the Western genre, was, was dead. But if my recollection serves me correctly... Uh, the novel was written around 91, 92. Uh, yeah, okay, and this is when um, Unforgiven won Best Picture. Oh, I guess that's true. And yeah. the 80s kind of saw a bit of a pop Western uh, boost with, you know, the Young Guns movies, and Eastwood came back and made Pale Rider, and then eventually the Unforgiven. Silverado. Silverado. Yeah, Silverado was big. There you go. Adam. The Quick and the Dead. Quick yeah, the dead. I, you know, I think so that... So let's, but... let's be fair and say that truly... If there is one genre that that is, you know, I mean, that's never really died, it's got to be the Western. I mean, you know, it's one of one of the few that just continues to endure. Well, it pops up now and again, but I would say that its heyday and its like most popular era was long past. You know what I mean? So every now and then it'll pop up. And if I'm not mistaken, I think The Unforgiven was the first time it actually got any sort of uh, traction since, you know, for quite a while although you know it pops up all the time i don't know it's just not like if you think about you know the days of uh henry ford um you know ford john ford sorry yeah well well, well <laughs> hold was, on before I'm we get to henry ford and john yeah, ford before but we I'm get doing... to john ford let's if you guys don't mind stopping and discussing henry ford <laughs> well, I'm putting together Henry Fonda and John Ford there. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, those days, the Western was hugely popular, you know, and then, you know, as you move into the 70s and 80s, it's sort of like they'll pop up now and again, you know, and like just what I kind of just felt with this one is that it was kind of like just taking hold of all those cliches and like you know in the film version it's just terrible, terrible. it is and, it's but un, in, it's the, in the in the book is actually a masterpiece right. so it's pretty interesting now you know? uh in fairness to billy bob thornton he initially uh uh his vision was for this film to be about three and a half hours long uh, his initial cut of the film was three and a half hours long is that right there are some people who saw that cut and really thought the film was was masterful some found it self-indulgent uh but i wonder if if it would make a difference to to you know to see you know the extra hour hour and a half that he wanted in there you know and if it would have you know flowed better and, and you know if that makes any sense because yeah everything just seems to be like just stockpiled into like this two hours of like you know just the music and the waterfalls and the male bonding and all that bullshit like you know it's just like it's all it's all too quick right joe i actually that's really interesting i'm glad that you found that Tom. i'm glad you found that information man because it kind of opens my eyes a little bit i it, that would be amazing to watch that because yeah that was the biggest thing i mean we're in the in the book in the spirit of the book that i was talking right. about 
there's this openness and this haunting, right. you know, this, this like this space and this, um, and you know, not this quick, this quick fire explanation and exposition of everything, you know, and that that probably is, I would imagine, what Billy Bob. Well, the, to me, for. you know, I mean, the the heart of the stories, obviously, I mean, not just Grady just leaving his family and and going on this quest, but during the quest, he he finds that love. And in the film, I mean, these scenes between Grady, uh, Matt Damon and Penelope, Penelope Cruz play, play the characters, they're just so rushed and quick and you just have yeah. no sense of care for either, either one of these two whatsoever. And the only, to me, the only thing that works in this movie is the, the, the prison, uh, so, you know, when he's in prison. I, I, I really enjoyed that. Like, you know, that, that half hour is done well. And it seems like he, like in the middle of this movie, he kind of stops and takes his time there, you know. And and I I really got behind that part of the film, but everything else is just is this crap. I I, I do want to uh, get Dave in. I do want to get Adam in. Adam, uh, you are a Cormac McCarthy fan. Uh, I'm I'm assuming. Uh, what do you think of Billy Bob Thornton and his take on uh, all the pretty horses? Well, you know, I I, I have not read the book. Uh, so I can't uh, make that comparison, but just based on the movie alone, you know, I'm a fan of Billy Bob Thornton, but yeah, uh, me too. I me think too. Uh, that he, uh, it was neither masterful nor self-indulgent, as you mentioned, like it was, uh, some people would say Perceived. one or the other. I, yeah. I just, I mean, it's, it's just like a simple cowboy movie and it was not moving. I think your points are well taken that, you know, uh, this, this passionate uh, love between uh, uh, Damon and Cruz and it was, you didn't have a chance for it to build organically. It just seemed rushed. And so Eat when yeah. they can't be together, it's like, well, it's, it's not as heavy as the movie would like that to be. <laughs> right, but, uh, right. but my, I also felt that Matt Damon, I actually really, really like Matt Damon as an actor. I, I like the choices so. he makes. And I know he picks movies to work with some great directors and has made just some awesome choices. Absolutely. Um, but I thought, even though this was this was 13 years ago and he was younger, he was still too old to play that character, I thought, because that character, mm -hmm. as a teenager, is, is more likely to have that kind of, um, I don't know, that passionate love, that, uh, uh, you know, ex experiencing the emotions on more extremes. Uh, it just felt he was a little too old for that role. I think it might have been uh, worked right, a little better. Yeah, there was like, a, like this, like from beginning to end, there was like, I mean, at least physically anyway, you know, and that plays in, in, into the into the character itself. He, there's a maturity, you know, like it's just already he's just mature. So there's yeah. no room. Like say like if you had given that role to like like someone like like DiCaprio, like if you give that role to Leonardo DiCaprio, it, it, it might make more sense. Yeah, the the character in the book is a teenager still, 17, I think 16 or 17 right, years old. So. Right. right. Yeah. He well, had yeah at the beginning of the film, he's he's, he's 17, I believe. Oh, right. right. Okay. So. Yeah, and he gets a little older as it goes, but he just seemed too old. And and the what you know, it's interesting. The screenplay was uh, uh, it was adapted by uh, Ted Talley, and I believe okay. he's the one that adapted uh, and and won the Academy Award for Silence of the Lambs. That's right. Uh, yeah. I I think he's won a lot of awards for various things. I know he was. I think he wrote the play Rosengrantz and Guildenstern are dead. But this oh, guy's wow. no, uh, you know, no. Uh, uh, he's not new. Or, I mean, he's been around. He's adapted amazing novels before but this one just it's like uh it's like a flat soda there's just nothing going on it's uh it's plotting it's slow it's boring it doesn't pull you in and cormac mccarthy i mean his his writing style is so just uniquely his and none of that was transferred like the other movies yeah. we're going to speak of where it's like you you can feel cormac uh, you know you can yeah. feel his words coming to life but, not not here and you could tell that there were like the those Cormac McCarthyisms there. Like I listened to some of the lines, and like you know, it's all there. Like you know, like where did you get that at the getting place? You and, know, yeah. I mean, and and those, it's funny when you watch all those movies close in close succession, like I did this weekend. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's like you know, in two of those movies, there's you know, there's someone flipping a coin to decide if somebody's going <laughs> to exactly. die. Where did you get that gun at the getting place? That's all. Yeah, it's there. It's all in there, and it doesn't translate. You know, it really doesn't. It doesn't come across. Who can you steal from if you can't steal from yourself? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's uh, let's uh, get Dave Pace it. Dave, how you doing, man? Not too bad. Not too bad, Tom. Uh, you know, I mean, you guys are kind of dead on about this movie. It's it's not good. Uh, and, and I and I don't think the thing it needs is more time. 
Right. You know, like I don't think giving this movie another hour was like, oh, I that know, would I know. It, right? Like, oh, this kill is me so now. Slow death. I just don't think that would help. Uh, I, I, but what this movie needs is either the sense of of mythic proportions that 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 Cormac McCarthy creates when he writes. Mm. Right? You you feel like you're reading mythology when he's writing and, 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 you know, some of the characters in his books are like Titans that walk the earth, you know, and then there's a real, just everything lives and breathes and, and kind of has a dark undercurrent to it. And it's, it's kind of frightening, kind of exciting. You know what I mean? And it, it's just it's nothing, none of that. There's fucking none of that in here. Yeah. Uh, and that's really sad. I, because I've not read this Cormac McCarthy book. I've read other Cormac McCarthy books. Uh, I love the man dearly and tremendously completely agree with joe that uh he's probably the one of the greatest living writers if not the greatest living writer and i don't think just for what he's written but for who he is but i'm sure we'll get into some of that stuff later i just i don't know i, I want to take a look at this movie a little bit differently because i think if you i was thinking about this today and like what are the redeeming features of this movie and what did i get out of it and i think instead of being this this story of the the sort of the the great American, I'm going to, you know, run off and make something of myself and fall in love for the first time. And it's like this, you know, coming of age story. I think it, it is a coming of age story, but slightly off. It's 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 somebody coming of age where they've completely given themselves over to the to the dramatics of youth. Right. Yeah. And just completely abandoned themselves to like, I'm just going to I'm going to burn all my bridges. You know, I'm going to do this, make this grand romantic gesture of walking away from the homestead and, you, you know, taking off on my own and and going to another country and trying to immerse myself in another culture. It's it's a it's a pursuit of annihilation that they're really on. Right. And and that's a that's a youthful thing. That's like a, I want to, you know, I want to escape uh, the conventional that I'm coming from and, and go and, and have this, you know, have this, you know, great adventure that I'm supposed to have to become, you know, a, an older, wiser human being, you know, and maybe you don't expect to make it out the other end of that, right? Like, maybe it's like, hey, you know, I'm, you, you, you've got this whole, you know, don't trust anyone over 30 kind of thing going on. And, and you know, like, that's, that's your thing. You, you think that everything is about what's happening right now. And, and so if you look at the movie where it's like you see that journey and so how sort of condensed it all is makes sense. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah, of course he falls deeply in love with this girl. He's never, you know, experienced that before. This is his first time. This is a big thing for him. You know, in a few years, this will be small potatoes probably. But for him right now, this is huge. You know what I mean? And so things like that start mm. to make sense a, a little bit. And then you can almost charitably sort of read the end as like, you know, he's 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 come back from this experience where he tried to sort of get away from himself or destroy himself or, or whatever else and found all these other things on the way. You know, he he realized he didn't actually want to die. You, you know, when they're out in the desert and they, they, they drag that poor kid off to be shot, you know, he's not brave enough to say, no, 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 you know, we're going to, you know, they, they let him go. They let him die to save their own skins. So, I mean, in a way uh, it's a, it's a reputation of how, Hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm off to seek my own destruction out in the wilderness kind of thing, you know? So it's, I don't know if you read it that way, it's a little bit different and perhaps a slightly better film. Uh, but it's by no means a good film. And I, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody spend much time on it. <laughs> Dave, Joe, Dave tries to give it some, some uh, weight. It's interesting hearing his take on it for not having read the book, man, because it, it is eye opening because, you know, when you read a book, you could just all you're doing, all I'm doing is like, oh, God, they're fucking this up. They're fucking that. Yeah, up. Yeah, no you know what I mean? So, like, I like I appreciate your take on it, man. I I want to digest that a bit, you know, but um, yeah, I, to me, actually, like when I'm seeing it, I actually do feel like it should be longer and more space because that's what you know like the road dave like you feel like both of those films well, like i don't know i don't want to jump too far ahead but right. you know it's that mood that yeah. that openness you yeah. know what i mean that, that that evokes in both the novel there's a cosmic and the film, you like know this I mean? cosmic sense of vastness yeah in anything that cormac mccarthy does that's 
Well, there's always this underlying God thing, right? Yeah, and what yeah, God and what God is and how he's playing through these the people, you know what I mean? And like there's a lot of it in in all the pretty horses, but it doesn't really tra- it doesn't really translate to the to the film. So you don't have that sense of this these grander myths being played out, you know what I mean? I will say that one of the ir- ironic things here to me and and you know, this is like a perspective coming from reading the book is that it, it definitely is like this uh this wish of American wild west dream fulfillment, I I think and uh it's just ironic that he has to go to another country to fulfill the american dream you know that is uh, that point. is interesting yes yeah it was just something i i picked up uh <laughs> just watching it you know what i mean like <laughs> right. because you know the american west has already been uh you know right. taken right. And, and claimed so he's got he goes into uh mexico to live out to live out the american well, dream it's I, funny in all of uh you know and everything that you know, all three movies in the sense, I mean, it's particular, all the pretty horses, no country for old men. It's like, even, even in that film in no country, it's like, you know, he, he makes his way to the border and he's got to cross, you know, he's crossing the border, you know? Oh, we should mention that. Yeah. This is a, is it, is it called the border trilogy, Dave? I think it, it like he's, uh, yeah, it's the border trilogy. It's uh, blood Meridian. Uh, this one was the first one. And then, uh, blood Meridian was the third. And then I guess no country is the middle. Right. One. No, but no, you guys, no, no, no. Was, I don't think Has anyone read Blood Meridian? I have. Yeah, I have. I, I have as well. It's, it's, I tried getting uh, getting through it, and I, I I have to give it another another start. I could not get through that book, and it, it I wanted to. Dense it's, shit going on in that book. It really is. It is yeah. a yeah. it is a fucking jungle up in that motherfucker. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's. Uh, I I feel like I'm way too deep inside McCarthy's head, and it's not a comfortable place to be. I had. To <laughs> wow, is it really? Is it that it's really it's that much, Adam? Well, it was also just a a, a, a different kind of stylized writing. I think that was uh, it was yeah. challenging to get through. It's like reading Moby Dick. It's like it's like there was so it's much. Like reading, other it's like reading happening. Chaucer or something like that. It really is yeah. like some of the language he uses is like, oh uh-huh. my god, what the hell did that come from? Well, well, let me ask. What, what does that even mean? What What is yeah. it? Uh, can someone explain to me ba- what it's about, basically? It's a, you want to do it, Dave? Uh, well, what? Oh, no, Joe, you, you do it. What Dave's gonna. Dave will take an a about. Yeah, Dave, Dave will. Dave will take an hour explaining. I, you know, as far as I remember, it's it's about basic cowboys. And shit. <laughs> it is a cowboy. It's another cowboy. Oh yeah. god! It's a basically about a posse who's hired to go oh, and hunt awesome. another. It's, they go to hunt. Uh, it's a. Uh, Shit, I forget who they're going on. It's been a while since I read it, but they're go- they're on the it's hunt, hunt and they Mexicans basically. It's right, Ma- Mexican it's and it's basically Indians and Mexicans. Yeah, um, so it becomes about genocide. It's basically American genocide, you know. And it's it's just it's gruesomely. And there's um the one character, the judge, is like this really e- like one of these McCarthy uh, ty- titans of evil. Yeah, oh, I God. love that dude. When he's talking about if that bird could fly higher than I, I must crush it kind of shit. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh man. That dude is amazing. It's only a matter of time till that movie becomes a, uh, till that they, They've becomes. really been trying, but yeah. hopefully it falls into the right hands. And it's it'll... supposed to be with the people who did the road because they did the proposition, right? Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, just... there was some crossover uh, involvement there with Nick uh, Nick Cave and uh, Guy Pearce. Yeah, were a couple yeah, of... yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, apparently that's where it's at right now. So. But the road, the the road is in the border trilogy. No, no, no. no, no that's no. weird because like the road, like it ends at a border, right? I mean, yeah, like if you if you think about it. McCarthy, I don't know. You, I don't really know all that much about the man himself, you know. But I, I think he, he's from and around the Southwest. Right? He's from the, uh, Tennessee, Knoxville, I think. Okay. Well, he was so, born in Rhode Island, from what I read, and then he had moved to his parents at a young age. They moved to uh, to, to uh, Tennessee. Okay. Well, yeah, that sort of explains all the pretty horses, actually, in a in a weird way. But yeah, like uh, the border is all down by texas and the border states down there by mexico they all take place down there he lives in new mexico now too i think and, and yeah. has for a long time nice 
Tom, what do you take? So, aside from your hatred of cowboys, what else? Anything else sticking sticking out at you with the with all the pretty horses? Or no, just what? like it just just seem it just seemed boxed. I, like I felt boxed boxed in and closed in like the whole time watching yeah. this movie. And I don't I don't think that that's the way I was supposed to feel. Yeah. You know? It felt like you a know, ride. Or, it felt like a ride. Y- like you a, know, and I'm like, because if you look. Or- Okay, if you look right. at the other at the other two, and I'm only going by these three movies. If the uh, the other two movies, like like the landscapes and the you know, the, like just, just every scene, it's like it's lyrical, it's musical, you know. And the Coens get it, and John Hilco gets it, and it just amazes me that Billy Bob uh, uh, Billy Bob Thornton, who's a Southerner, doesn't d- doesn't know how to translate this book into film joe yeah you know man i i know i know what dave's saying about like not wanting to see another hour of that of this mess you know what i mean yeah. but it's just weird that you when you said that it was like it made a lot of sense to me like it seems like maybe this was a victim of uh you know, uh, Monday afternoon quarterbacking where the studio may, may have come in and been like, dude, you can't put out a three hour film. Uh, you know? I hear you. But you, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. That dude, the dude who uh, directed the uh, Deer Hunter, uh, the Cimino. Michael Cimino, he did a film uh, after Deer Hunter that people hated. It was called Heaven's Gate. Heaven's and Gate. I think yeah. I think it was I think it was due to the fact that you know, the studio really cut this movie down to like a two hour picture. And I think, and I could be wrong here, but if my memory serves me correctly, like 15, 20 years later, this three and a half hour director's cut comes out and people have like a whole new take. I really like that. On, movie. on the I film. And, they, yeah, and, it and now it's like considered like in, in some circles, not all, but in some circles, like a, a, a fucking American masterpiece, Heaven's Gate. And so Dave says, you know, well, I don't want to sit through another hour, hour and 20 minutes of this film. But I'm really curious if yeah, I would definitely check it out just yeah, out of curiosity, just, you know, just what I mean? out of fairness. And I like I like Billy Bob Thorne. I love Sling Blade. This is the thing. It's like he made Sling Blade. And I think he does this right after. Uh, I, I so like too. him because he was hitting Angelina at the right time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he had the right Angelina. It's awesome. <laughs> but you know, you know what I'm saying, Joe. Shit, you want to be hitting that shit during the <laughs> nights and the blood and the fucking making out with her brother at the Oscars. That's when you be hitting that shit. That's her. Uh, oh, what was the movie she was in with Winona Ryder? She was like, she was a little loony. She was incredibly sexy in that movie. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. I, uh, uh, oh. You don't want her in the, is that, the, is, that the, the is that the Clint Eastwood movie? No, no, no. no. She's in the. You know what I'm talking about, Adam. Yeah, right? the, the period uh, piece, uh, A Girl Interrupted. That's oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who's crazy, Jolie or Ryder in the movie? Uh, they were both. Uh, jo- I, they were both. They're in a they're in a mental asylum for women. And Jolie, <laughs> Jolie plays uh, uh, she plays a, a, a young woman with borderline personality disorder, <laughs> and she, she does it very well, by the way. Like Livia Soprano. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. But you know, I, I, Tom, I'm the. Uh, I actually, it's. Uh, it's not like I get a thing for cowboys, but I like the western. You know, I. I am a fan of westerns. And so you're uh, gay for cowboys. I'm. I'm kind of hot for cowboys. Okay. And right. uh, no, for, the western genre is one that I like. It's like a. It's definitely in my mind a go-to genre. Like we were talking about earlier, it's kind of. It. It has its ebb and flow, and it's. Uh, uh, popularity but it's never gone away it's never been anywhere mm-hmm. uh, now, are, you more, are you more into the john ford uh classical western or do you like the Not you know the sergio leone stuff uh what all that stuff's fun i like i like a lot of what clint eastwood has done over the years i love um the high plains drifter is a great one it's just That's because true. that one is like it's surreal it's just so strange unforgiven i thought is a is, is just a great movie uh, I could never, I could never appreciate Unforgiving, guys. I love it. Love Everyone that, that. loves it. I cannot get through it. Well, because you don't like cowboys. You, Tom, you need like rock and roll in your westerns, like like uh, to, uh Don't young guns. start reducing me, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Just goofing around, Tom. Take it easy. Man. I, <laughs> Tell me, Tom, you must you, you must have liked Blazing Saddles. Come on. I th- yeah, I love. <laughs> yes, I love one. Blazing Saddles. <laughs> All right. But I think Young Guns might be the only western I own, Joe. 
<laughs> well, you, uh, I remember being into to- Tombstone with you yeah, a long Tombstone. time. Ago. We talked about that too. Yeah, Tombstone. But it's that's all pop. That's pop stuff. I you know. know? I, I, know. I mean, I you know. guys. I mean, you know, Joe. I know you have this extreme appreciation for John Ford that I just don't. Yeah. I can't have, and it annoys me that I just. And I've tried. You know, I've watched John Ford films, yeah. and I just. You know, I can't get into John Wayne. And I can't. Oh, man, I watched Old Men Who Shot Liberty Valance not too long ago. It's fucking amazing. You know what it is, man? It's like, it, it, it's like you almost see the creation of the American myth, like, mm. right, like right in front of you when John Ford's doing his thing. And, you know, a couple of those other guys around that time were, were doing it as well. But The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, it's like it's just myth making. And the American West is is just such fertile ground for it. You know, you're going into distant lands of, on a hero's journey. You know what I mean? And, and so like anything's possible and what these guys were laying down in the fifties and forties and fifties and sixties and right. with those films, like it just set the tone for, and just, it, it's just remarkable that it, it just set, it just created a, a language. You know what I mean? Like it, it's just the creation of a language. Yeah. Well, all, all, all that nonsense aside, Joe, Adam, uh, Blazing Saddles is probably the best Western that I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> that that might be Deadwood. You ever see Deadwood? But, you know, I did watch the first season of Deadwood. I kind of got into that. And I never, I didn't pick it up after the first season. But I remember when it... actually my uh, all-time favorite television series. If I had to pick, if I was forced to choose, I, I might have to say Deadwood. And, Deadwood, wow. You know, great. It's so gritty. It's so dark. But the thing that I love about it, it's David Milch. And he has a way of dia- oh, use dialogue where right. he creates his sort of his own like cadence and language pattern. And I know that I'm not, I didn't come up with, with this concept that in terms of like calling this sort of like a Shakespearean uh, uh, Western Deadwood, but there is a, a, a cadence and a rhythm okay. to the dialogue that makes it very Shakespearean. And there are soliloquies and there are these just amazing moments and it's just, and uh, it's just a great, great series. And that, if you, uh, I would recommend that uh, because even though it's, technically a western and they're cowboys it's it's got a, a different angle on it you might No, i dug it i dug it for uh like i said i watched the first season and uh maybe i will go back and watch that i i could i could probably do that but the reason why i was drawn to it is because i i really dig walter hill and, yeah. and, and walter hill i think was one of the executive producers on the show he probably directed a couple episodes but if you guys i don't know if joe and dave i'm, I'm dave probably is familiar with walter hill but joe joe might not be walter hill did like you know southern comfort and the warriors uh film 48 hours films like that you know and i i just mm. i always liked his uh fucking awesome fucking movies yeah, really awesome movies. And Streets of Fire he did, Adam. I don't know if you ever saw Streets of Fire. You're talking about Michael Paré and Diane Michael Lane. Michael Paré and Diane Lane, yeah. It's just such a, that's a very surreal movie, you know, and, yeah. and, and uh, a movie that I, I truly love. Well, I'll, you know, I might bring uh, Walter Hill to the table one of these days, guys, without a doubt. Uh, we are talking All the Pretty Horses, directed by Billy Bob Thornton, based on a Cormac McCarthy novel. Guys, uh, I want to start wrapping this segment up. Uh, does anybody else want to throw anything out there for the uh, for the listeners? I just want to ask Adam if uh, he feels un- like insecure and uncomfortable without his pal Max on on board Ooh. here. Is it? <laughs> is it un- is, are you like? Do you feel like you're missing your security blanket or something? Very very <laughs> awkward. I'm I'm not sure what to say or how to handle myself. <laughs> now, you, no, you know Max please. and I actually we we live we live our separate lives. We just come together. We we either we're coming together to work on something creative or we're coming together to. Watch Jackass and ridiculousness, and just drink and goof off. Uh, See, I always just picture you guys as like uh, Laurel and Hardy or <laughs> Ab Costello. Like, no matter where, where you, wherever you show up, like you, you got, you guys have to be next to each other. <laughs> well, if we are at the same place, we're usually next to each other. So uh, Adam wise. is Adam is Abbott, and Max would be Costello. I think so. I think, oh, yeah, oh, Adam yeah. is definitely the straight man. <laughs> so how do yeah. these guys, let me ask you this, because you were out there in Los Angeles. You had the uh, great opportunity to be on the Mimosa podcast. And uh, guys, I, I want to let our listeners know that Max Cook will be here any second. But before we bring him in, Joe, how do they, I mean, what's it like, that dynamic between the two of them? I mean, is it, it, is it intense? Oh, it's great, when sitting, I mean, Yeah, because it's really—it's exactly—it's funny. It's just funny because when you uh, 
Well, we kind of talked about my visit to Max's on the intro to one of those Redux shows, you know, my visit to Max's. But, you know, they're they're very much uh, on air. They're very much like, you, you know, you hear them. They're, they're Max is sort of uh, this uh, neurotic kind of uh, self-effacing pile of uh jelly or whatever and and and, De- uh, and uh, adam's there to kind of like the foundation the mooring of the pair you know but uh it's it's a blast hanging out with those dudes man if i was out there i'd be uh, you know i'd definitely be up there a couple times a year you know guys that was let's a bring- good time that was that was a lot of fun yeah it was a blast man guys let's bring in max cook what do you say yo bring him in let's do it gentlemen good evening uh-oh Princess Max, welcome to the show. Princess Max. <laughs> Max, I had, I had nothing to do with that, I swear. <laughs> oh, God, I don't even want to hear the opening segment. How's it going? <laughs> yeah, bullshit, you'll go back and listen to it. We were talking about you for the whole half hour. Oh, no. Oh, God. We didn't even get it. I mean, Joe, how many sentences did we get in? For- we didn't talk about all the pretty horses at no. all. We talked about all the pretty Maxes. That's right. <laughs> Adam, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good, thanks, man. I meant to call you earlier today just to catch up before this, but uh, that didn't happen. Fine, I was. I'm just worried about you. Are you sick? You're de- why? What, What's going on? What's happening? Oh, I, I pulled uh, one of those things where I myself didn't go to the doctor for too long after injuring my leg, and I uh, had uh, cellulitis, so I had a blood infection, which uh, uh, was, you know, was not fun. But uh, since I've been to the doc got all my shots, got some antibiotics, and uh, things are all uh, healing up nicely now. It's getting better, right? I'll tell you just to... Oh, absolutely. That was just me being a, you know, a fool and, and thinking, right. oh, yeah, I banged myself pretty hard and scraped it up, but it'll be fine. And it was, it got you know, a pretty bad infection. Adam, I'm the same way. I, I avoid the doctor like the plague. It the funny sucks. thing is I don't have a, a problem with going to the doc. I like my doctor. I have no problem going... But uh, this was just one of those things, like me being a typical dude saying, "Eh, you know, it's a it's a yeah. mild wound." Yeah, thing. man. I don't I'll need take no care of myself. <laughs> oh, I'll man. sew it up myself. God damn it! <laughs> he would too, like uh, Anton Shigar. Heck yeah, basically, I'm pulling the cigar. I got my I got my wife sitting there looking at me, going, "You got a bone coming out of your leg." And it's like, yeah. Just give me a t-shirt and a needle and thread, and I'm good to go. Yeah, you just t- take a take a little uh, trot down to Rite Aid Pharmacy, and uh, <laughs> you know you you blow up a car out front, and you, you take what you need. Grab what I need, seriously. No, I I did. I walked on a broken ankle for five years without knowing it was even broken. Oh yeah, wow. I do. <laughs> That. That's a real man. Now, Max, <laughs> you, you, Max, you get a checkup from the doctor. What you go twice a week? Are we doing the show now? <laughs> yes, he live, He lives. Max, with, is he has always a doctor. Doing, Max is always. Are we doing the show now? He always wants to know. Why do you make me talk like this? Are we doing the show now? <laughs> Why do you make me have to be such a fucking chick? Well, because you don't come on unless you love the movie. I mean, you're, you're like. <laughs> No, um, I don't like that. Yeah. No, no, so I'm no, no. I'm no ten of pain. I just, uh, <laughs> I just had, I've had no time. I wasn't even supposed to do this show. But come on, you got we, the can we, check, can we check Max's Facebook posts and see how much time free time he's oh, had? I haven't been on exactly. Facebook in a while. <laughs> yeah, Saturday night his wife went out. He had like eight hours to himself. <laughs> it was a good night. I have no time. That's not fair. That's masturbation time. Oh, hi, Dave. Hey, listen, guys. Uh, oh, quick dude. business here. Hello. Uh, I think we need to change Dave's opening because uh-huh. it yeah, mentions Fangoria. We're working on it. We're, 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 we're in the works on that, Max. Um, we're, we're getting Okay. And then the other thing is I changed everything for the – well, not everything, but I updated for the uh, Halloween show. Ooh, I am so looking forward to that, Max. Yeah, but I changed it. You changed it, the movies? I, I no, looked no, at those still, movies. What? It's still west of Memphis, but you changed but, the other two. The one, I, the one you assigned me, I, I was, I was excited about. Well, we can always go back to it, but if you don't like the theme that I changed it to, we can change it back. It'll be a surprise for all our listeners. <laughs> oh Anyone listening right now? You keep you guessing. Yes. Yeah. You won't tell us what it is, right, Max? Right now? What will the cutting room players do in the future? 
<laughs> Tune in next week to find out what Max has decided. Exciting future events will happen in, in the, the future. In the future. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's. Are we in? Are we, we going? Live let's in go. In a world of wonders and marvels. In the future. Max, I wanted to take a couple minutes and say hello to you. It's been a I'm while. I'm sorry. I know, Tom. I miss you. How's your How's your gout? Great. It's never been better. How's living with your dad? It's been interesting, to say the least. Oh, God. That it's sounds challenging. I can't, I can't spend uh, more than, uh, like, an afternoon with my dad before I start Dude, losing Well, my I, uh, it's just, I mean, it's... Uh, it's just a circumstance. It's what I what I'm doing. Max, I did go to the doctor today. You did? Yeah, I got a doctor, a local doctor, and I'm going to be seeing him regularly. I'm going to be getting checkups. I got some uh, serious medication that I'm going to be taking and everything for the you know to to battle the gout, and hopefully we're going to whip it, this thing. Is it narcotic medication, Tom? But but on a good note, and I said to Joe <laughs> earlier off air, I. Uh, my blood pressure's uh, fine. Wish that that means borderline. It's borderline, but it's he says that it's it's fine. He says it's are normal. You, are you well, taking a multivitamin and fish oil? No, no. But I I I'd be willing to do that. Go to. It's not expensive to get a multivitamin. They're nothing. Like a thoroughbred M. Does that still exist? Uh, I would recommend getting the gummy vites that you can just chew like little gummy treats. Ooh. I, like I got your fish too. oil right here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> we know Dave's not on fish oil. Now, I do use oil, Max, but not for what I think. Oh, you're... God. Oh, oh, God. I'm, on, I'm on fucking Ow. fish oil over here. I'm going to slap some oil on my joint. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, feels so fucking good. Dad, close the door. <laughs> <laughs> Try to yank my joint here. Oh, uh, uh, oh. Uh. Hey, son, I heard you ejaculate last night in the bed. <laughs> oh, my God. Joe, have you met his dad? <laughs> no, I, no, I haven't. Does, it, does your dad let Carlos sleep over? <laughs> I'm not with the Carlos. Can we please put the Carlos thing to bed? Please, I beg the both of you. Mr. Tom, I was so excited to live with you. And then you come to me and you say, no deal, Carlos. My papa move in for me instead. You'll break my heart. Tom, you are the leader of the show. I don't know why you let it get this far. Just yeah, I had everything. Adam, segment. did I not have everything under control? <laughs> you, you actually had things under control, and then someone let Max in the room. And now things have <laughs> <laughs> just spiraled. Just spiraled. Wait a minute. I Where the hell you, is I... Carlos going to live now, Tom? <laughs> I'm living outside the window looking up longingly at Tom. Wait for him. You can fucking record my organ meat, buddy. All right, listen, enough about my health. <laughs> Hold on. Enough about my health. Enough about my father. Enough about fucking Carlos. <laughs> it's time to move on. It's back to Cormac McCarthy. All right, guys? And this time we're bringing, the, we're bringing in the Cohen brothers. Which is, oh, thank God. Which is something, Joseph, that is long overdue on this show. That's true, man. How do how did we get this far without doing the call? Any even really mentioning them? Not at all. ever talking about them. I mean, we am, am I busting the Cohen brothers' cherry? On hell this? yeah, you are, Dave. You are doing it. We got Max uh! Cook. We got Max Cook here. We got the counselor here. We got Joe Christiana, and we got Dave Pace, and he's going to introduce the 2007 Best Picture winner, No Country for Old Men. Directed by the Coen Brothers, based on a Cormac McCarthy novel, Javier Bardem, Josh Brolin, Tommy Lee Jones. Let's do it, Dave. Let's hear what you got, dude. 